Hello, and welcome to episode number 26 of Boutique Talk. My name is Jake Boston, otherwise known as Steelbook Obsessed on all your major social media platforms. And if you want to listen to all things physical media related, then you've come to the right place. Every week, I have on a new guest to talk about their physical media journey. And tonight, my guest is my go-to source to receive 4K Blu-ray and DVD sales numbers and analysis. It's Mega Mike, the movie man. How's it going, Mike? Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm doing good, Jake. How about you? Uh, doing fantastic. I was so, so happy that you chose the movie that you did because this is like one of my favorite go-to movies to just like pop and get into a good mood with if I'm feeling down. Man, I was so happy I chose this one too because it's been a while since I've seen this one and it yeah, was time cool. for a rewatch. So I liked it when I first saw it, but on the rewatch, I'm like, man, I'm loving this movie. This is this might become a staple for me. Right. I, I I watched it in high school for the first time, and then I did not rewatch it until this set came out. I was able to pick this. I I couldn't wait. I didn't. There was no U.S. release announcement, so I picked it up in the U.K. because um, it's 4K. It's region free. And as soon as I popped it in, I've probably watched this sucker four times since I've had it in my collection for three years. It's just, I love this movie so much. It's just comfort food to me at this point. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a romance feel-good film, isn't it? So, <laughs> Yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but this movie feels like you're watching a dream almost. Like, nothing feels real in this movie. It all feels, like, hyper-sensualized, I guess. And, I, yeah, I love every second of this movie. Oh, yeah. So good. Yeah. But before we get to that, I like to talk to my guests about their collecting journey. So how did you get started collecting anything, let alone movies? I see some pops in the background. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. This is my game room. So a ton of pops in here. My movies are in the living room. So, yeah, I kind of got to go everywhere for my collectible stuff. Mm -hmm. But, oh, man, you name collecting everything. Woo, I've been collecting ever since I was young. You name it. Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, board games. Like, I have a collection of Monopoly games mm -hmm. in my closet. Like, I have so much random things. But, you know, just Pops. Pops, probably about eight years ago, I really got into Pops. And then I got so many. I'm like, okay, I got to pause on the Pops. There's too many of them. I can't collect them all. <laughs> and then for uh, movies, my family always loved movies. Just growing up, my dad would take me to the theaters every weekend. My family had a big video collection, VHS and DVDs. So I started kind of collecting just myself on my own a little bit later on with the Blu-rays. And, you know, actually one of my favorite pickups was actually my first still book was the Dark Knight Rises still book with the cracked mask and oh, yeah. the rain on it. Good Ooh, when I was working at Best Buy and I saw that, I'm like, I don't know what that is exactly because I wasn't into really the collecting space as much with movies yet where it's like oh what's a still book i'm like i don't know what this is but it looks nice it feels great i need this i want it this is like my there favorite movie it looks so cool let me pick that up and so then i was just getting blu-rays here and there but then i would say it really picked up probably man when i really dived into this youtube blue tuber space uh i guess three or so three, four years ago, and I just listened to everybody's YouTube, and they were recommending so many titles and talking about boutique labels and discovering all of this, and I'm like, ooh, I want these movies, and I just kept getting more and more movies, because every time I try to do something different, like, oh, let me go stream this. Streaming always lets me down. I'm like, man, I should have just bought this on a Blu-ray. <laughs> No, I, I feel the same way. And yeah, I did not know. I, I knew what Criterion was from a boutique label side of things before YouTube. But as soon as I started watching a lot of like pickup videos from YouTube, I'm like, oh, wow. OK, I don't I don't know what this is, but I want to see more of it. And I just collect it and it's gone insane ever since. The, the YouTube community is definitely good at like exploration of movies and collecting and all that fun stuff. I know. As I learn more about movies and collecting, I'm like, man, I don't know nothing. <laughs> as I learn more, I feel like I learned like, oh my gosh, what is all this? this right. There's so much out there, though. So much yeah. to dive into, which makes it fun, though, because it always brings it up. Yeah, no, I like like you. I've been collecting ever since I was young. I think it started when I was six with Pokemon cards. Like I oh. was really into that first Gen One. Had to collect every <sighs> single one that I possibly could. Trading cards on the playground, it was the best. And man, the Game Boy games, it's just like heck yes, yep, with the link cable to trade stuff. Yeah, yeah. I went hard, man. I went hard. Yeah. 
uh, it's funny. I've got a couple of uh, uh, girls that are in elementary school right now. And currently the fun thing to do is trade Pokemon cards on the playground. Just like, wow, it's been what? 25 plus years and people are still doing this. That's absolutely wild, man. That explains why Pokemon is the strongest selling IP out there. They're just everywhere. They got everything. Pokemon go, you name it. They cover TV move. They have everything. (laughs) They didn't care about Pokemon until it was in like a happy meal. And then they finally had cards and they're like, I want more of these. And then like, People were handing them out. Um, they had like these Halloween booster packs for trick or treating. So just by not doing anything, they magically had like a set of like 10, 12 cards. And like, I want more of these. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I will fuel that for you for sure. Yeah. There's yeah, something about Pokemon. It's so addictive. I remember yeah, one of the yeah. games I clocked in over 300 hours. Oh, and I'm wow. like, I don't know how I did this. <laughs> Like, what happened? This must have took a few years. (laughs) I'm glad I never looked into or really kept track of, like, how many hours I logged. Because I didn't have any, like, gaming systems that hooked up to a TV. My parents wouldn't allow it. But they would allow me to have a Game Boy. So I sunk so much time into that sucker. I don't even want to know how many (laughs) hundreds of hours I wasted doing that. But it was all for the fun. It it was great. Um, The Funko Pops behind you. I I collect... I had a fad of Funkos, for sure. Um... I tried to limit myself to only the ad icons. I'm an advertising major, and I love all to see all those suckers in one spot. So I probably have like 40 of those. There's a ton of them. It's just you get to a point where it's just like, wow, I don't think I'm ever going to collect all of these. So I might just stop completely cold turkey. It's impossible. Yeah, and when but... you realize that, you're just like, I have to stop at some point. So I'll pick up a pop occasionally. You know, if one catches my eye while I'm looking for movies at a Target, sure, yeah. I'll add another one to the collection. But it's not like I used to. Used to, it was wild. I used to be like 4 a.m. in the morning at Hot Topic to get the Chase one. That's how wild I was yeah. about it. <laughs> I'm like, wait, something's wrong here. What was this? Like? Stop. <laughs> I, I got sunk deep into like their online presences, like Funko Days, or like it was close to Christmas, yeah. like four days of Funko, where they had the exclusive mm. ones on their shop. And I went hard. Like they had a giant Tony the Tiger that I got. Like, I was big into those. Like, I'm like, okay, I, I only want to collect all the cereal mascots or I only want to collect um, all the, like the McDonald's figures. I'm like, I, I got to be very specific because if I'm not, this is going to get crazy real quick. Man, especially those super large, the 10 inch pops right there. I think yeah. I probably have about 30 of them now. And I'm like, oh my God, these take up way too much space. I have one and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to store <laughs> any more of these. So I, Tony the Tiger, I like him quite a bit. And yeah. It, well, right now they're in storage. I had all of them over there and it just took up way too much space. So I don't know what I'm going to do with them now. They're just in a box sitting and I don't really like that either, but I don't want to get rid of them. The I know. Oh my gosh. Here. Yeah. That is a collecting dilemma right there. What to get rid of, how to get, see the problem, like I'm okay to get rid of stuff, but I don't want to go through the hassle. Like have to find somebody to buy it. Then you got to ship it. You got to pay for that and packaging. Yeah, I'm yeah. just like, I never want to deal with the hassle. So I'm like, I need to get rid of some stuff, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> right now, I'm into collecting the Funko sodas. I, I like those; oh, they don't take up that much those. space. I, I have um, I have a superhero themed bathroom here in the basement, so I'm collecting just superhero sodas. But there's a ton of those too. Like I'm running out of room in my bathroom for those. Man, there's so many. Yes. I have like a Marvel section over there, a DC section over there, and. Yeah, right. it's impossible to collect them all. <laughs> you got to have multiple rooms for sure. Just like here. Oh, yeah. One hobby's collecting in here, and then my movies are in like my main basement space, and it takes over quick. Uh, yeah, I have Funko Pops everywhere. Like, right. <laughs> I have them all in this room. This room is like dedicated to all this stuff, and mm-hmm. then I still have them in the living room. So, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're talking about movies here. It's a movie podcast. Let's get yeah. back to yeah. collecting your childhood. Um, <laughs> You said your parents had a big VHS collection. Do you remember around like how many movies they had? And was that like a big thing? I know you went to the theaters every weekend, but how big was like the collecting side at home? Oh my goodness. That family collection, like my mom now has them in boxes. Once we went over the Blu-rays and all that, she boxed everything up. Yeah, Hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands, like literally mm-hmm. each box. Because when I went back to her house to visit, I did a whole like haul video or I guess unboxing or whatever you want to call it. I went through like probably 30 different boxes of just VHS just stacked in there. So 
and there was probably about what 30 a box at least 30 to 40 50 like wow. it was a ton of them and there was repeats too i'm like my mom was a double dipper apparently i didn't even know this <laughs> she probably didn't realize it either though yeah, yeah. And it was then, hard to keep track of like a database that long ago you'd have to do it like pen and paper and stuff Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was no way keeping track. And you know how it is when you're in the store. You're like, oh, I really want that. Wait, do I have that? I don't know. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and get it. And then you would get some as gifts as well from other family members. And then when my grandma passed away, we got her VHS collection. And it was just, oh, my goodness, so many. Oh. So VHS, you... I love VHS, but they take up too much space. <laughs> I'm like, I, I can't see these over too. here. <laughs> right. I, I, think I, I think right now I have about... Probably 400 ish, and I think that's maxed out for me just because they do take up a lot of space. I love them, it's just that I have enough kids' ones. I any horror one I will pick up that I don't have, and then some kids' ones. I have a kids' section in my uh, uh little video game room right behind me, and the kids can pop in a tape and they do it all the time. I have one of those TVs with the VCR built in, so they can just pop it in and out. Um, but other than that, I think I'm kind of tapped out, maxed out of space for VHS tapes. Man, that's great to hear, though, that they know how to work like a VHS player and all of that. Mm -hmm. You ask kids today, they don't, most of them don't even know what a DVD is anymore. It's so sad. Right. <laughs> well, like, I mean, oh, when we go down every Friday night, we have a family movie night. And half the time, they just want to watch stuff that's streaming. Like, even if I have the movie, like, I can just play it on Disney Plus, Dad. I'm like, no, but I got the movie back here. It looks better. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to lose this battle, I think. Let's just play the movie. Man, I run into that problem all the time. Like, uh, my uh, brother-in-law came out, and I tried to get him to watch True Romance. I'm like, okay, what kind of movies you like? He was like, okay, Quentin Tarantino. I'm like, oh, this is written by Quentin Tarantino. Got a really nice 4K edition. You're going to love this. And he was like, eh, let's just watch something newer. Uh, how about Ricky Stanicki? I'm like, okay. Ugh. I guess we're doing Ricky Stanicki streaming over True Romance 4K. What Terrible has the world story. come to? <laughs> I mean, the world has come to convenience. <laughs> and I I love collecting this stuff, but I know that I am like a dying breed when it comes to that stuff. I like to have my stuff look as nice as possible and be like at, at just very easy to find. Like all my stuff is alphabetically done just because if I want to watch a movie, I know exactly where it is. I'll pull it off the shelf, do it. Half the time, like if you want to stream a movie, you never know what streaming service it's going to be on. If you have a subscription to that service, it's just it's kind of a nightmare if you are like in the mood to watch a very specific movie. Man, just this last Sunday, I had a buddy over and he was like, oh, I want to see this movie called Chef, the one with uh, John Favreau. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, let me look it up. I don't have the Blu-ray. You know, I'm short on time. I can't get this in in time. But let me see if it's streaming. Oh, it says it's on Hulu off of Google. Okay, no problem. Come over and we'll watch it. I pull up Hulu. Not there. It's a Stars add-on. I'm like, oh no my way. gosh. With all these streaming services I have between like Hulu, Netflix, Paramount, Max, I still don't have them all apparently. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. So he was like, oh, okay, I'll just rent it. We'll, we'll just rent it. And it was a big hassle. It literally like took 20 minutes because he had to sign in. He had to mm -hmm. go to rent it, and it was still, it was just acting so wonky. I'm like, if I had the Blu-ray, I could have put this in in a minute, and we would have been good, and it would have sound better, it would have looked better. Correct. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it drives me nuts. But, I honestly, like, I when I first started collecting in, like, 2013 is when, like, I really started getting into I started collecting in college, but I really started to go deep, like, 2012, 2013. And my friends would ask to borrow my movies all the time. Now, I want to say the only friends that ask me to borrow stuff are ones that have gaming consoles. Because if they don't have a gaming console, they don't have a player to play anything with. It's oh, kind of yeah. sad. Yeah, and a lot of people don't even know the gaming consoles are players. Like, I have yeah. to remind people on the channel all the time. They'll leave in the comments, and they're like, oh, I don't have a player. How do I do I'm like, well, do you have a video game console? Is it this generation? You know you can play Blu-rays and 4Ks on that one. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't even know. <laughs> so a yeah, lot of yeah. people have players and they don't even know. But yeah, they just right. want the convenient app, apparently. I mean, yeah. they say it's convenient. I just, every time I use it, something happens with my internet. It starts buffering and then, or if it plays, the quality uh, just degrades. And I'm like, it looks like I'm watching a VHS now. Like, I wish I just had the disc. <laughs> 
<laughs> one of my big pet peeves is when I'm watching a movie and like it's a very dark scene outside and the blacks get all pixelated. Absolutely hate that. It takes me out of the movie watching experience. And that happens pretty 95% of the time when I watch anything streaming and it just bugs the crap out of me. I, I don't like it. I'd rather just pull it off the shelf and have nice crispy blacks. Yeah, I rarely leave a streaming moment happy. Usually I'm disappointed with one way or another. Yeah. Ooh, Lisa Frankenstein. Like I, I tried streaming that on Peacock. I stopped 20 minutes in. I'm like, I am mad right now. Like I, I was enjoying the movie, but I can't hardly see anything that's going on just because streaming, buffering wise, it was terrible. So I have the Blu-ray. It looks a hell of a lot better in the movie I had a fun time with. Yeah, I saw that one in theater. So it was only in theaters like a maybe a week or two like movies are leaving theaters so fast and with all the movies i see like do you think i would see everything but movies are just leaving so fast i can't even keep up with it all so yeah what it, it streamed valentine's or it was on in theaters valentine's day weekend yeah. i believe and i got it sent to me the last week of march like how crazy <laughs> is that oh man i that, mean that I, window is just going away so fast it's like it's good and it's bad like, I guess it's good for people that don't want to go to the theaters. They just want to get into their collection fast. But I think mm -hmm. it's destroying the industry, like the Hollywood machine. It's like, this is why movies aren't profitable anymore. Like, you need a theatrical run to make all that money at the box office, then go for paid on demand, and then go for physical, and then streaming. Like, this should be like a year and a half to two year process before it gets there. And it's yeah. like, two weeks later, it's already there. <laughs> We're, we're slowly climbing our way out of that COVID uh, crypt that we really got buried in in the box office. Um, I want to say like 2018, 2019, the box office was making like $11 billion a year, somewhere around there. And last year we had about $8 billion. So we're, we're getting there. It's just a slow, slow creep out. I'm hoping this year it looks like we are in for a good summer i mean with the strikes and everything there's not going to be as many movies as there were last year even but i'm still excited to go to theaters i just know at least in my friend group that has kind of waned since covid people would rather just wait two months stream it online than go spend 50 60 dollars at the movie theater man if i didn't have my unlimited regal pass i'd probably do the same thing but Oh man, those unlimited passes are so amazing. They have yeah. saved me so much money because it's like under 20 bucks for my Regal. It's like 19 bucks or something a month. Mm -hmm. And I literally go at least every week, sometimes twice in a weekend if I can. So I'm like, yep, I'm getting the value for sure. <laughs> right. I, 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 I love taking my family to movies, but we tend to go to the drive-in because the drive-in, it, it's like seven fifty a person and food is dirt cheap there, or you can sneak it in if you want to. I, I know we're going to go see Inside Out 2 in like an actual like IMAX theater or the biggest big screen, whatever one is playing it. I know I'm going to spend over $100 just on tickets, and they're going to get candy and food. It's just going to be a whole thing. I mean, for certain circumstances, it's worth it, but I would love to be able to just bring my family to a movie any time of the week because you only can do it on weekends. They're going to be packed. It's going to be more expensive tickets. It's just... Yeah, it's become a hassle, and that's very unfortunate because I want the movie theaters to strive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can understand. Like, with a family, it's tough, too, especially how young are the kids. It's like some people need to get babysitters, and that's tough, and that's an extra cost. So, yeah, it's just it depends on your situation. For me right now, it's just me and my wife. I have her Regal Pass as well, so... Mm -hmm. You know, it saves us because we go pretty frequently. And then it's cool, too, because sometimes they'll give us some reward points and sometimes I'll be able to get in a friend for free. So that's really cool. Nice. Yeah. But I asked my friends and most of the time they don't want to go. <laughs> They're like, I would, hey, you want to go to the theaters to see this? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. I, I wish I had like an AMC or a Regal in my area. I live in the Midwest and Cinemark's run oh. the roofs where I'm at. And they oh. their movie pass, whatever the hell that's called terrible it's like ten dollars a month you get one movie ticket and save like 20 percent on concessions i'm like this is not even worth ten dollars to me it's not no oh my gosh yeah cinemark the worst deal out there i mean right. for a major theater chain you think they would have something yeah, the, they're the third largest out there and they just yeah don't do anything oh man 
I've had bad experiences with Cinemark. I'll tell yeah. you. So you have <laughs> great really popcorn really buckets really to collect. Other than that, oh, yeah. Actually, I did get a Cinemark bucket because I was in a uh, Vegas the other week. So I'm like, oh, yeah. well, I'm here at a Cinemark. Slimer. I will yep. get the Slimer. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was so expensive. I'm like, Vegas Cinemark? I spent it was like 25 a lot. bucks, right? I think so. Yeah, because I got, what was it the DX screen for yeah. Godzilla? Kong. XD, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So two tickets for that. Yeah, it had to have been like over 50 bucks total with tax and everything. Oh right, my right. gosh. Yeah. And then. Not to mention little Slimer over there. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that came out with the ghost face head and the 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 Billy the Puppet Jigsaw head. Yep. I love those so much. I'm, I'm really hoping that more of those. I feel like popcorn buckets are having a resurgence in theaters with like the the, the Dune bucket. And I saw one for Ghostbusters that looked like the the Ghost Catcher. It oh just, yes, yeah. very I cool. I love collecting that stuff. That's so cool. <laughs> I love the way that has like I, wheels on the bottom too, right? Uh, yeah, there you go. So nuts. Yeah. I absolutely love I've been collecting popcorn buckets for like five, six years, and just the ones that kind of catch my eye. Like, there was a really cool one I have for Black Panther Wakanda Forever that looks mm. like like the statue, the Black Panther statue. Oh and man, that's I have awesome. one for a uh, toothless, um, for how to train your dragon, and a lot of cool ones that I like, but I like seeing how they're coming out with pretty much every major movie that's come out in the past like six months man i like it and then i don't like it because of the wallet i've gotten into collecting them too in the last just couple years i'm like oh they look so great now i want this one and that one but i'm like oh wait no, i gotta pause this i'm gonna have too many before i know it so now i decided okay just for my favorite movies yeah. and the ones that i think are really cool unique designs correct yeah i'm not just going to grab everyone that comes out they have to really stand out to me and be for an ip that i really like <laughs> yeah that's I, the way I, to go about it just, just like collecting you got to draw the line somewhere right? yep, exactly yeah. um but let, let's kind of go back to like the physical media space uh you said you learned about boutique labels watching youtube and stuff do you have a favorite boutique label out of all of them oh yes Criterion. Oh, okay. Criterion is the one I was first introduced to. And I mm -hmm. think Criterion's just catalog of titles. It's unmatched. They have so many titles in their collection and such a variety of titles yeah. that yeah. now I kind of found my area of Criterion I like because I've made mistakes with Criterion before. Sure. I'm like, oh man, this movie is not for me. Okay, so now I know what I like. I get more of the mainstream, has to be like post 80s. A lot of comedies in there, that type of stuff. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I've been super happy with them. Uh, but their special features, I love their packaging designs. That they just look so clean together. That's true. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I just I love what they have to offer, and they're the only boutique label that I always do a stream for. I do a pregame and a postgame sale show for them just to prepare for their sales mm -hmm. in November in July. Just because right. I love the sale time. And plus, they're at Barnes and Nobles. Well, not all of them. That's a sad thing. But to go away. Barnes and Nobles, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can at least go out there and do shopping for them. And you can't do that for every boutique label. So that's really cool too. So Criterion has always been my go-to number one, but mm -hmm. I would say Arrow's number two. Gotcha. Um, for Criterion, do you tend to only pick stuff up during those sale months or like oh, the yeah. flash sales they have? Yeah. You know me. I'm the sale person. Yeah, I love a good deal. I will only pick stuff up on a sale price. Like if they're trying to sell something for, because those 4Ks when they come out now are what, like 40 plus, 50 sometimes? 50 bucks, yeah. Mm -hmm. No way. I, I don't care. <laughs> they could release my favorite movie of all time. Mm -hmm. You know, first day, $50. It ain't happening. I'm not paying for it. I will wait six months for the sale. Because with uh, Criterion stuff, it doesn't really sell out too often. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at least yeah. right away. Yeah. Yeah, and they rarely go out of print. I think yeah. maybe it's a few that have gone actually out of print. And then mm -hmm. usually those titles will show up on some other 4K studio label later. So. Or just won't have like the exclusive packaging. It'll be yep. like the mm -hmm. standard edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why I tell people, yeah, wait for the sale times. I mean, for every boutique label too, not just Criteria. Always wait for the... There's always another sale around the corner. So okay. like if your budget's tight right now... In a few months, there's going to be a sale because they do flash shells too. So mm -hmm. between the flash shells and the major sales, there's like four times a year you can get everything half off. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I, but I still limit myself during the sale times. I don't go wild. 
I pick usually about five titles that I'm really interested in that I think Mm -hmm. I will like, and that's what I go for. That's what I learned. I used to just pick up stuff that everybody was recommending, but then I got a couple in there. I'm like, I'm never going to watch this again. Why did I pick it up? (laughs) Right. I, I, I learned about Criterion by working at Hollywood Video. I've talked about that a few times on this podcast, but I really started loving to collect for Criterion at Barnes and Noble, just like going there, going through the shelves, just being rewarded by browsing is like the best feeling in the world retail wise. And the last sale they had in November, they shrunk their space. Like I, I have two Barnes and Nobles that are next to me. They probably shrunk their physical media criterion space by a good 60%, 70%. There's barely anything to look through anymore. It's just, it's sad. I, I really get bummed. Like for me, I don't, I like to go there to make content and stuff, but yeah. I mean, my, my inner self just likes to go through and browse, but with the, as many, as little titles as they have now, I feel more obligated to just purchase online, which I really, I really don't like. I like to find like the best copy, grab it, buy it, bring it home. Yeah. I have the same issues with them too. It's just so limited now. So I usually get most of my physical media online now. Uh, occasionally I'll still find something when I go in store, but a lot of times when I go in store, it's just, they don't have what I'm looking for. Right, right. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a bummer. Right. Yeah. Dre- I, I love collecting for it. Just the, the retail shrinkage is just bumming me out. I know this is my future in five years. It's probably going to be gone from all stores, but I'm going to grab on to what I have right now. Cause right now it's Barnes and Noble, Walmart, yeah, that's about it. I mean, there's sprinkles. Target, and Target kind of. Target anymore. has like a half aisle. Yeah, I don't even bother at Target anymore. <laughs> I I used to make my rounds like they're in like a half mile span where I live. There's a Best Buy, a Target, and a Walmart. And I, every Tuesday, I would just hit every single one up. It was great. And now it's just okay. I have a Walmart to hit every other week. It's just like it's it's not the same, man. Really oh, and Walmart is so inconsistent. I just released a video talking about this, like Walmart yeah. inconsistency. Depending on which Walmart you go to, you get a completely different experience and just Correct. completely different what they offer at each one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've noticed that one of the Walmarts that I work next to, they do not care about release dates at all. It's like the oh, Wild yeah. West, man. If you find yeah. one of those little honey holes, just go there. They let stuff out like, six seven days before it's technically supposed to hit shelves like whenever they receive it on the truck they just put it out there good to go yeah it's it's weird and like just yeah restocking some of them do it every couple weeks three weeks i've heard of them even like taking a month to re-put out new stuff (laughs) at that point i mean like what's the point of the blu-ray tuesday anymore it doesn't exist anymore it's gone (laughs) yeah it's sad it'll it'll always be here in my heart but I, i feel like yeah it's just gonna be clicking a button on a screen or my phone it's just like yeah. it it doesn't hit the same and you got to wait for it to get to you in the mail but yeah and what do you do it's inevitable at this point even is in good condition that to me is the worst part of just getting stuff online what is the condition going to be and you know with still books and all these nice boutique labels we get oh my gosh if it comes in damage i'm just oh got to send it back get a new one it's it can be a hassle Correct. Yeah. When it, like I, on the arrow video sale, I finally bought like the big, nice edition of the enter the video store box set. Mm -hmm. And one of the corners has like a crunch on it and you can see it from the front. If you could see it from the back, I wouldn't care, but you can see it from the front. So I still have it shrink wrapped. Like I want to dig into it, but I'm like, I kind of want to return this too, but I know arrow arrow is very like inconsistent on what they can like give you a refund for what they even have in stock to resend you. I just don't know what the hell to do. And I hate it. Oh yeah. It's it's so tough. Like, I remember my True Romance one was one I had to send back because the top was literally, like, halfway torn off. Right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is not going to work. I can't have this. Mm-hmm. Especially uh, when you spend so much money on these. It's like you right. want them good, at least decent. <laughs> it, it's nice that the majority of these boutique labels will work with you. They just want you to be happy so you continue to go there and do a repeat purchases. It's... Aero Video is the one that I've had like the worst luck with ordering online just because they're working with the Hut Group now. And that is just, I don't know. I feel like their return policies, you never know what person you're going to talk to and what mood they're going to be in. They could be either be the play ball nice or you're screwed. Like that's the 
flip coin that I've really ran into with him. Man, yeah, I try not to even order directly from Arrow anymore unless I have to. Yeah. Because when I bought Witness, or at least I thought I bought it, I paid for it. It was like ready to go. It's like, okay, it's going to be shipped. It's processing. All mm-hmm. right. I'm like weeks later. Okay. Still hasn't gone out. What's happening here? Another week. Another week goes by. And then I get an email saying, oh, it's not in stock. Wait, what the heck? <laughs> it was in stock when I bought it. What do you mean it's not in stock? And so I completely missed out on the nice witness edition. And after that, I'm just, I'm like, I'm over right. that. <laughs> yeah. The, the over, the over sales on some of these things are very ridiculous. Like you, I would think a website should be able to put in the quantity that they have and only yeah. sell that and not oversell. I don't understand how that happens. Yeah. You would think with technology, how it is now, you think they would have that ironed out, but well, me, oh. me being a, uh, a steel book collector, I like doing the boutique steel books like the Nova Media's, Kimchi DVD, that type of thing. Their stuff, because they know how much they have, their stuff sells out in like a minute, 90 seconds. If you're lucky, you got to be quick on the draw because I don't know if bots are just like gobbling all these stuff up, but it's hard to get stuff at retail price nowadays, especially on like the very limited stuff back here. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm like, I know I'm going to miss out on certain things. I don't even worry about it anymore. I'm just, I'll, I'll wait for the deal, and it's always a risk. It's always a chance. Sometimes you miss out on it, but hey, if you don't, then you get a really good deal. So, <laughs> hey, but then you save space too. So, it's still like a win win. <laughs> yeah, I, I need, I, I, I'm in the process right now of building more shelves in my other room just because this is getting. Like right now, I'm pretty much maxed out. That's why I have a stack over here of like 120 movies I still have to put away. There's no room for it. I I need to build more shelves so that can hold another 800 movies just so I have places to put them. Yeah, I'm just thinking of where I'm living in. I'm like, how many more spots do I have left for shelves? Yeah. I'm like, I have maybe a couple spots in mind, but after that, I'm, I'm capped out on it. What else do I do? <laughs> and I'm picky with my shelves. I... I can't stand like double stacking them or like having a row in front of another row. It's like, mm-hmm. how do you even know what's in front of that or how, what's behind that? You'd have to be have like a super great memory. I like to look at all of my collection, see the spine, know where it is, pull it out. I don't want to like move a stack to get to another one behind it. That stuff drives me nuts. That's how my pops turned out. Now I don't oh, even sure. know all the pops I have because I'm like, I don't know what's behind the other pop. I don't remember. Uh so i'm like i don't want to get that way with the movies yeah no no gosh no no thank you um let's see here i'm ready to talk about some true romance before we Mm -hmm. do i kind of want to uh get into some of the comments here man myth media just cracked into the special edition of true romance you haven't watched it oh Oh, god you need to watch it i we are when we talk about it we are probably going to spoil true romance because it's kind of hard not to oh yeah and i i want to talk about it badly Yeah. yeah What's up, Film Addiction? Uh, hey, you like Mike's out of the theater reaction videos. Very cool. How's it going? Uh, my goal is to grab some more Criterions this year. Absolutely. Every year. Every every year you got to add to that Criterion collection. You need more Criterion movies? Wait till June. June is when they're going to have the next half off sale. Hey, Mikey, how's it going? Good to have you here. You want to know four favorite films? Yes. Infinite Character always. Or Happy Optimist now. A name change, I see. Okay. He always wants to know my guests' four favorite films. Oh, Do you absolutely. have those off the top of your head or just a uh, couple? Oh, of course. So, okay. uh, The Dark Knight Rises, number one. I love that movie. So, I'm a big superhero. Dark Knight Rises? I love The Dark Knight Rises. Wow. Everybody always gives me something for that. They're like, <laughs> oh, most people love The Dark Knight more. Some people yeah. like Batman Begins more. Mm-hmm. I think I know maybe two other people that like Dark Knight Rises more. But I love the character arc in Dark Knight Rises because you get Bruce Wayne who's just broken down to his very core by Bane. Mm -hmm. And Bane is his first physical threat in all these movies. So I love that aspect too. But he gets broken down and then he has to kind of go in Rocky mode and like train and embrace fear and get out of the cave. I love that arc. Bruce Wayne has the best character arc in Dark Knight Rises, in my opinion. So I just, I love that. And then I think Bane's a great villain too. So yeah, I don't know people's complaint with Rises. Rises to me is just so good. So yes, and that was the first still book I got. So Mm -hmm. Dark Knight Rises, number one, and then The Dark Knight, number two. Okay. Uh, Number three, Rocky IV. I love Rocky movies. That is my most watched franchise of all time by far. I watch 
that franchise at least like two to three times a year, every single one. Five and six just got announced on 4K. Nice I know. Yeah. I know. I'm, so excited. I'm mm-hmm. waiting for that collect that complete collection, though, with yeah. one through six. I want them. I want to say all six of those are going to come out in like one steel book. I think I kind of saw that leaked a little mm-hmm. bit. So, yeah. That's what I'm Me too. For. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, yeah, you got to go Halloween, original Halloween. Sure. Mm-hmm. I think I'm more of a Rocky One fan. I think Rocky One is probably the best sports film ever made. I, I love them. I think it's absolutely perfect. Man, you don't want to see my ranking video then of the Rocky movie. Oh no! <laughs> I have what one I don't. Like the bottom. <laughs> the first one at the bottom. I love. I love them all. I oh, absolutely man. love all the. Actually, the only one I don't like is the. What's it called? The director's cut of Rocky Four, Rocky vs. Drago. I still haven't seen I, that one. I yeah. hate the director. I think it's a bad movie. Because it takes right? out the robot? No, it, it completely changes the tone of the movie, and they mm-hmm. change the villain. Like, they have Ivo, like, talk a lot in the movie, and yeah. when he talks, he just sounds so stupid. I'm like, there's mm-hmm. a reason why he shouldn't be talking a lot. Let his physical presence be enough it's yeah once you see it you'll know what i'm talking about like a lot of the scenes they take out i'm like why would they take that out and then the ones they added in i'm like no you really didn't need that Mm -hmm. (laughs) so what are you on the creed franchise uh i love creed 2 that's one of my favorites uh creed 1's great creed 3 was definitely a step down but i still love it i yeah i liked it too i liked how they kind of took a big swing with that final fight they did something oh. different, and in a boxing movie, doing something different, I got to give them kudos for. Oh. Even if I wasn't the biggest fan of every part of it, I still like that they did something different. Oh, man, yeah, that, that's where it lost me. Like, I loved yeah. how it got artistic and went into that kind of dream realm. But the problem for me was it was too short of a fight. It's like it skipped yeah. over so many rounds. If they were able to incorporate that, but we saw every single round, I think that would have been a different experience. But that. It just went too fast. Went right. way too fast for me. Uh, but I love all the Rocky movies. I still love Rocky One. Like I, Rocky One's great. But I mean, I'm comparing world. great to great. Yeah. But it's more of a drama, you know. And I more mm-hmm. like when we get into the blockbusters of Rocky Three and Rocky Four, and these just these villains are so great. Oh, the lines, the hearts on fire song for Rocky Four. You can't do better than that. <laughs> See, I, I personally, I would put Rocky Four towards the bottom. Five is the worst, but four, it's just the montage of it all. I, I, I love the hard for me to take seriously uh, in that one. It's just, yeah, it's definitely of its era, and I, I'm okay if that movie stays in that era. Oh, man. It's like the superhero one of that whole franchise, and I'm like, I'm a big superhero fan, so sure. I have to go with it. Sure. And then I like Rocky Five for the Mickey stuff. I think the yeah. Mickey scenes in Rocky Five are actually probably the best Mickey scenes out of the whole the frame. kid stuff I, never worked for me in that movie <laughs> at all <laughs> yeah it's not perfect <laughs> right let's see here i agree with you about the walmarts went to five in my city and each one yeah it, it, it's the wild west out there with walmarts you just kind of gotta find one you like <laughs> and stick with it man um in a group named Cin- sunday cinema but before that we have a thing called watch 90s someone fortunately picked true romance i promise yeah, you have, yes. If you don't think you're going to watch True Romance by the end of this podcast, we've done something wrong. At least for yeah. me, because I am going oh, to, me, for sure. yeah, <laughs> I, 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 it's going to be, it's going to be great. True Romance, really, who recommends this movie? Yeah, I, I love it, man. Oh, you got the new Steel Book? Yes. Mm-hmm. The, when we talk about True Romance, I will go over the packaging, because this is one of my favorite packages in this. You know what? I, I'm ready. I'm ready to get started in talking about this movie. You, you ready for it too? I it's, it's so cool. Let's get into it. Before we go, I have like a 30 second TV spot to play for True Romance just to get everybody in the mood for the movie. Let's get to it. From the director of Top Gun and Beverly Hills Cop 2 comes a movie that will leave you breathless. Yeah! Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, Dennis Hopper, Val Kilmer, Gary Oldman, Brad Pitt, Christopher Walken, in a Tony Scott film that critics are calling a Bonnie and Clyde for the 90s. True Romance, rated R. See, that that trailer was of the time, and I love showing trailers like from that era, because sometimes they don't know how to market a movie, or sometimes a movie hits before it really would gain popularity. This is the perfect example of when, if this movie would have been released three years later, 
I feel like it would have been a huge hit. But because it got released in 91, people didn't know what to do with this thing. Or 92, 93. I think it got released right after Reservoir Dogs. So I think 92, okay. 93 ish. I don't know. I was thinking 89 for some reason, but I might be off. I don't know why was I thinking that. No, it has to be 90s. You're right. Um, I know that Tony, uh, Quentin Tarantino pitched no. Tony Scott. He gave Tony Scott two scripts one for Reservoir Dogs, one yep. for True Romance. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to say it was they were made around the same time, but I think this came out after Reservoir Dogs, right after Reservoir Dogs. So I think it was around 92. I think that's my final answer. I'm, I'm buzzing <laughs> it. Um, but yeah, every time I watch this movie, it just gets better and better to me. Um, I love every single character in this thing. They they all have their own little mini arc, and they're very memorable to me as well. Um, yeah, I, I I could I could gush all day, but you're the one who chose True Romance. Why did you decide to go this route? Well, first, like you mentioned, the packaging. It is the best packaging of all time. From uh, Arrow, definitely might be any boutique label. Like, look, look at, at that the, packaging. You have the seal book? Oh, packaging? yeah. Okay. Oh, my gosh. You got to have it. This One is like- cool thing about this release from Arrow Video is that they have a steel book release and a standard release, and the boxes are two different types of artwork, which I absolutely love. Oh, yeah. But there, this is a, it's a steel book release of an Arrow Video release, so I, I had to pick this up. And this one I imported from the UK. I could have waited a year. I didn't know if it would ever come out in the US, but yeah, just... Christian Slater on the front, Patricia Arquette on the back. Just look, it's so simple and so good. And the inside, like it comes with a sticker from True Romance with a logo on there. The character cards are great. The, there's a poster in there and everything. I don't have to show off all that, but just yeah, the, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for great artwork on my packaging. And this is like top tier for me. This, this is very good. And the simplicity of the steel book with just the two characters on the front and back. I I'm mean, it has, it has everything. Like, even the still book, even if it's, you know, simple in nature, because you just have the characters, the coloring with the background, the outfits, like, you can see, like, shadows in the faces, the details. Mm-hmm. Like, there's just a kind of a, a glimmer to it all. Like, ah, I love it. It's just, it looks so good. And then the inside, like you said, the postcards, the little tattoo, the posters yeah. in there. I think they have two posters in there, actually. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh my good it's jam-packed with so much in there yeah and it's a still book and a really cool arrow box like arrow doesn't do that with everything right. i think have they ever done a? they might have done it one more time right the steel book in a box yeah have they or is true romance the only one was wild things did they do that or no I, they did i did not get the steel okay. book box for that one because i wasn't a big fan of the artwork that the steel book box came in yeah, I didn't get the still book one on that one either. So, but that's the only two I can remember that did the still book in yeah, a cool box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, usually you have to choose. It's either okay, you get the still book or you get the fancy box. This they did it together. Right. And I thought after they did that, they would keep doing that and they didn't. I'm like, why? Why'd you stop? Like you had something boutique label like Arrow. Come on, let's keep going with this. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, like with this and with Wild Things, they came out with two different boxes. And I, I like how you got to choose which artwork you liked better, what packaging on the inside you liked better. Just give the collector the option to choose which one they have a preference for more. I, I absolutely love that. What drove me not like, um, this isn't a boutique label, but the Disney Plus Steelbooks, the 4K and the Blu-ray Steelbook look exactly the same. I feel like there are so many lovers of Star Wars and Marvel that would have double dipped if the steel book artwork was different on both of those. For some reason, they didn't go that route, and that still baffles me because I, I would have loved to have like two different things of WandaVision. I love WandaVision. Oh, that's my favorite Disney streaming show right there. WandaVision, the sitcoms, it was perfection. It was so good. Yeah. But yeah, doesn't surprise me with Disney though. Disney is always the right. shortcuts, cheapest way to do stuff. They're just not tied into the collectors. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I I went on a side tangent there. Let's go back to true uh, romance, man. Yes, yeah, so back um, to the nice true romance, and even the disc artwork right there. Yeah. Like it just fits with the whole still book. Like you don't get that all the time, and it's just it's gorgeous. I love packaging yeah. that doesn't give away yeah. anything about the movie on here because sometimes oh, yeah. I, I I don't know about you, but I like to blind buy some movies and just kind of pop them in watch them and hopefully they become like one of my new go-to movies and it's in the collection. I love, I love the discovery of movies that way, but sometimes you get on the package and it shows you like a major scene in the movie. Like, Oh, I guess this happens in here. 
Like I just watched Audition the other night and on the cover it's just like the the main girl like getting ready to torture somebody and that doesn't get revealed until like 15 minutes before the movie ends. It's just like, okay, whatever. That would have been a fun twist, but what do you do? Yeah. This one, like you said, it just shows some characters and it just shows like the two major ones on the steel book. That's all you need. That, that's all and you need. Right? Just to see the cast names, because this was a blind buy for me. I didn't see this movie until I got this set. Oh, wow. But I saw the names up there. Mm -hmm. How could that be a bad movie? Speaking Once I of, saw that, I'm like, yeah. let's go. Speaking of cast, like like I said, I, I hadn't watched this movie in so long before I bought the Arrow Video one. When the titles roll and you get to like nine, ten actors deep and it, they're still like banger actors and actresses, you're like, oh my God, I'm in for a treat here. The cast is an embarrassment of riches. It's oh crazy. Yeah, Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, the main two. But then you have Dennis Hopper. Uh, Gary Oldman, like a role you've never seen him in before. I didn't now, even know that was him. Like I was looking right. for him in the movie. I'm like, isn't Gary Oldman in this movie? Like who was he? And then when I looked it up, I'm like, he was Drexel. Oh my gosh. He yeah. just, that was a whole new person. That was amazing. And I like how a lot of these actors, like they're just in and out. They might be in 10 yeah. minutes of the, a lot of these people are only in like 10, 15 minutes of the movie, but they're so memorable in what they do. I love, I love how, uh, uh, not Dennis Hopper. Uh, no, yeah, no, Dennis Hopper. He plays, normally, he only plays like a crazy person. And here, yeah. he's the straight man. I thought he played a great straight man in this movie. Oh, his scene's brilliant, too. I remember just watching it again with the commentary. And it's a tough scene because you know what's going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. And he knows it, too. And it's just that tension. But then he still goes off on the person. But yeah. it was kind of smart thinking because he wanted it to be over quick. He didn't want to draw it out. and Because you know what they're going to do to him eventually anyway. Why make it a torture out of it? Just, yeah. you know. And the main scene you're talking about is yeah. with him and Christopher Walken. Which Christopher Walken, spoilers, is only in one scene of this movie. But that scene is so memorable between the two. That might be the strongest scene in the entire movie and honestly, they didn't really need to do that at all. They could have just like put the pieces together in just like a random off sentence. But the scene was so strong here, and the conversation between the two, the mind games that were going on between the two, so so pitch perfect. Oh, the script is so good. I mean, the dialogue you can just tell it's a Quentin Tarantino written film. You know, it's going to be a great script. Then, correct. Yeah, correct. that scene was awesome. One of the, I, I'm a big special features guy. I like to talk about those when I talk about these releases. One of the special special features, I want to get this right, is with a um, someone who wrote a book on Tony Scott. And it, it kind of goes over his career and where like true romance kind of like evolved some of the project that would come before and after and how it's like a very unique in his filmography. But I guess um, Quentin Tarantino, he had this one mega script that he decided to chop into four different scripts. Those four scripts were Reservoir Dogs, True Romance, Natural Born Killers, and Pulp Fiction. Those all became four different movies. But kind of watching, in particular, this movie and Natural Born Killers, there's a lot of like connective tissue thematically in these movies. Like you got the 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 couple that are kind of on the run and so in love but causing like destruction along the way whether they mean to or they don't mean to it's just yeah they i love tarantino and i love how some of it, the majority of the movies he makes are great but then the two that he decided to hand off to somebody else they are still distinctly tarantino but shot in another director's style tony scott does a great job with this movie i i love the I, I love the bright pink colors of the sky. I love just like the random like pillow feathers everywhere during the final scene. It's little touches like that that you don't see a lot in Tarantino's work that I appreciate the blending together of the two. Oh, this was a perfect combination. I actually don't think I would love this movie if Quentin Tarantino directed it because finding mm -hmm. out through the commentaries, Quentin Tarantino was planning on a different ending yeah. for this movie and I thought that ending would have been terrible. Like, if that's how this movie ended, I would have been like, I'm so sad, though. <laughs> yeah. One I, cool thing about this release yeah. is that it has the alternate ending on yep. here. It not only does it have the alternate ending, it has the alternate ending with commentary by Tony Scott. And then it has 
the same alternate ending, but with commentary by Quentin Tarantino. And they both pretty much said they were butting heads on the ending. They filmed both. They shot both. They tested both. And at the end of the day, Tarantino was a little pissed that his ending didn't win, but now he's happy that Tony Scott's ending is the final definitive ending because his didn't really fit with the themes that the movie was going for. Well, to me, it would completely change the genre of the movie because for me, I see this as a romance film. Oh, yeah. If you go with the other ending, it is no longer rom. It's drama at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Complete drama. Oh. It's more and like a Romeo it. and Juliet ending, and it, yeah. it, it did not feel right in this movie. The it ending that we right. got here, although it is very abrupt, I, I like how it kind of fits with the fairy tale aesthetic that this whole thing has running through it. Yeah, I'm like, I used to be a hopeless romantic, and to see, you know, true love conquer all by the end, that is exactly what I wanted to see out of a movie like this, and I love that. I right. love how the movie just went for it. <laughs> Well, speaking of going for it, um, there are, I, I kind of want to talk and pinpoint about like every single, not every single yeah. character, but like the main people that are in here. Yep. Val Kilmer as Elvis uh -huh. is absolutely bizarre. The trailer, I don't know if you noticed, it actually showed all of Val Kilmer's face. And in the movie, you never see his yep. face. It's always just like from here down. Yeah, and the commentary, uh, Tony Scott was saying, yeah, we can't show your face because people want to see Elvis when it's Elvis. If you show the face, it's going to give it away. But I think it actually worked out really good because the voice was awesome from uh, Val Kilmer. And Val yeah. Kilmer did a great job with what he had. And they even said in the commentary, like, he really worked at it. Like, he got into the Elvis personality and would always be practicing and singing Elvis just to really become that character. Mm -hmm. And I think without showing his face too, it makes it more of that, you know, dreamlike sequence. It's very bizarre and fantastical, but in a cool, different kind of way that makes it unique for the movie. And it also kind of puts into, I, I, I guess not perspective, but the, the Val Kilmer character lives solely in uh, Christian Slater's mind and not showing all of the Elvis persona. It, it kind of plays to that. It doesn't make you like, have any like hey that's Val Kilmer playing Elvis it's just like no this yeah. is Elvis this Elvis. is happening in the mind of someone who seems sane but really really loves Elvis and really wants to talk with him oh man Christian Slater oh his character his character is so great in this movie his character for the first 20 minutes is Quentin Tarantino like mm -hmm. he he wants his, his dream day is to go see a triple feature of kung fu movies and have a girl randomly come up to him and just sit with him, fall in love with him, and just love the stuff that he loves to do. Man, I'm like, this is heaven right here. <laughs> like, this, I, like I saw myself. In the, I'm like, a person that's going to the movies all the time, and he doesn't care if he goes with somebody. He just wants to go see the movies. Lives like, in a comic book shop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, he pulls out the Spider Man one. Issue. You want to see my Spider Man comic? Like, look uh -huh. at how cool it is. And the girl's like, oh, yeah, I'm into this. I'm into Elvis. <laughs> I'm into you. Like, what? The... <laughs> I don't think that happens in real life all the time, but this yeah. is cool. <laughs> to me, that, that's what, like, this whole thing, I think I said at the beginning of this podcast, just seems like a dream. It's like a lot of this stuff would not happen in real life at all or the way that it plays out so pitch perfectly it just i don't i don't know it, it it's very memorable and you just want to go back to sleep and relive this over and over again yeah oh. it's very very good um one person that acts like he's asleep at all times is Brad Pitt uh, oh. it's crazy that he is just stoner personified he he hasn't really played a character like this before or after but he plays a stoner pitch perfectly. And I laughed at pretty much everything he had to say. Oh my gosh. And with the honey bear bong too. It's like, uh -huh. what, the heck? <laughs> what yep. is this right here? But he has such a small part in the movie, but it's just funny and right. cool to see him. It's like, he's just the perfect amount. <laughs> yeah. Just random side characters in here. Like uh, his roommate, uh, Michael Rappaport. Like oh, he, yeah. he really didn't need to be in here either. And I like, it, it's his whole, arc is a little bizarre because he he's an actor but when he yeah. goes through his audition it's not great like it, it seems very wooden to me but yet he still gets the part he on the tv the show the which is kind of part of the dream scenario again like even though you're very average at this you get the role 
you spoilers again you escape all the gunfire at the end so you continue to have your career and hopefully everything goes according to plan just yeah i i like that character but again didn't need to be in this movie besides just like having our two main characters have a place to live in the setting <laughs> but he's he's still very memorable I know, and he's just such a happy character. Like his personality, you just there's something you like about him. Right. Uh, that's why I think I like this movie so much. It's like the really happy characters and just these main characters. Just at the end, it, it works out for them. That's awesome. Yeah. But then even even the people that are pure evil, like yeah. James Gandolfini. Oh, oh my God! Like he yeah, was brutal. he has played a gangster perfect forever. Because even in this movie, like he's just a lackey. But he is so pitch perfect at being both charming and pure terrifying at the same time. Like that that uh, fight scene he had with Alabama, absolutely just no. Worst case scenario material there. Oh my gosh, yeah. He was so scary in that scene. Yeah. But it was a perfect scene. He was so good in that. It was just, and he could have totally like won the fight, but he got over cocky too. And then Alabama and to play you know, with his prey. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Um, did you end up watching? There, there are two different versions of the movie yeah. on this set. There's a theatrical and the director. Which one did you watch? So the rewatch, I did director's cut. I think when okay. I first watched it, I might have gone theatrical, but yeah, the second one, director's cut, and you could tell. Lots of violence in right. this one, especially with that scene. And I think the yes. tractable scene, they add more. Yeah, yeah that, that's the main difference between the two is just like the amount of violence and like the amount of hurt that Gandolfini puts on Alabama is yeah. brutal. Like it is crazy. Oh, yeah, it, it it makes you want to look away. But then Alabama just kind of takes it like a champ. Very much a badass in this scene. I loved every second of it. She is so good in this. It, she really becomes like the hero in this one. I mean, it's really her movie in the yeah. first place because she opens up the movie too. Uh, but yeah, that scene and she, she's so smart in too. She like makes, she's like, Oh, you look so hilarious and stuff. And then he looks at himself in the mirror that she's able to grab. Uh, what was it? Like the cologne or whatever soap or whatever it was and get in his eyes mm -hmm. just to get the upper hand at the end. I'm like, Oh my gosh, she is a very smart character. I like seeing that. Correct. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think. There are so many characters. I don't want to miss any. We have the the two um, federal agents, just the agents. Yeah. We have Chris Penn and uh, Tom Sizemore. Like, they are a great one-two dynamic duo. And I would see a whole movie with just them in it. And oh, just yeah. getting the five, ten minutes we do of those characters in this movie, I, yeah, I just ate that stuff up with a spoon. <laughs> it was the best. The dialogue scene with the questioning there, and they're just playing off each other, going back and forth. I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is golden right now. This or the elevator great. scene where they're like, uh, he's not going to kill him. Oh God, he's <laughs> going to kill him. Like, it's just, yeah, <laughs> that stuff is so, so good. Oh, and in the elevator scene, the 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 agent's, uh, the agent's side person, uh, 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 Bronson Pinchot, that's his name. What? Oh my God, he had so much material just to kind of play with here he was slimy yet <laughs> he had he felt like he had a little bit of power and he used it he was getting a random blow job while having coke <laughs> on him driving swerving oh, getting pulled uh, over by a coke yeah he, go, he got a slapstick scene with all the coke getting thrown oh, on his face. That part's so funny <laughs> There are a lot of great characters. I could say like all of them are my favorite, but his is the one I probably laugh at the most. Him or Brad Pitt, they're like a one, they're a very close combination. I loved every single second of Bronson Pinchot in this movie. Oh my gosh. I'm, it's tough. It's tough to pick your favorite characters out of this. So if I had to pick a couple, of course, you know, um, Alabama, it, mm -hmm. because it's her movie. And she just she just commits to this role in here and her outfits and stuff like the outfits are so memorable in this movie. We haven't mentioned that yet, but just all the stuff she wears, it's like very unique for this movie. It's she just has such great romance scenes with uh, Christian Slater's character, the phone booth and all that. You're like, oh, this is this is great. Okay. And then uh, Drexel, of course, Gary Oldman just becoming a completely different person. And that's like a Mortal Kombat match. That he has with Christian Slater with the acid house music playing. I'm like, oh my God, this is like a Mortal Kombat fight right now. Let's go. Right. And then Christian Slater, like Alabama's character, you think he's going to lose, 
But then somehow he gets the upper hand by then and just turns it around. And that's why I like the ending they go with, because it's like they went through so much in this movie. You want a good ending for them yep. because they just they went through this whole journey. Yep, you don't want to see it any uh, yeah. any other way. I totally agree with you. Like the the original or the alternate ending that they chose, the the Tarantino ending had a Christian Slater dying at the end, oh. and then Alabama kind of goes, money, right, and goes off. threatens to kill herself, like puts a gun in her mouth, and then finally decides to live out her days and just kind of go off. And that did not seem like a great ending to me. The one that they decided to go with, where both of them survive. That you find out that they have a kid and uh, they name him all times. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, so it, heartwarming. It, right. If it's if it's the fairy tale ending, it sticks to landing, then yeah, I I enjoy the ending that we got here for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, the, the one thing that, like I said, this is like the fourth time I've seen it in three years or whatever. Um, every time I see Samuel L. Jackson's name <laughs> pop up in the credits, I'm like, he's in this movie. Um, I always forget he's in like the first 10 minutes of this movie. Oh, yeah, at a Drexel <laughs> hangout place. Yeah, and this scene is just to show you how much of a threat Drexel can be. Because you didn't need to have this scene, really. You could have just had Drexel uh, meet Christian Slater at that scene and be totally fine. But to have, like, this five minutes to where Drexel is a complete badass and kills everybody in the room while being super charming up until the flip of a coin happens and he goes all brutal with a shotgun on everybody. It's just... It's a great scene. And yeah, Samuel L. Jackson is just one of the victims and blink and you miss him cameo, but it, it's still good to see him. Man, now that you're you're telling me this, it's like it's opening my eyes even more. I'm like, yeah, that's like his like a super villain scene with that. Always oh, super yeah. villains have those moments where they gotta show, okay, they're very powerful. Same with um uh before James Gandolfini gets to the Alabama part, right? He's introduced with Christopher Walken's character and he like cuts right Dennis Hopper's hand and you know mm -hmm. caused that pain with him. So you kind of have an intro with both of them to show, okay, these are dangerous villains right here. You do not want to mess with them. It's not gonna be good when that happens. So right. oh, I love that. And I know that there are a couple other like main like character actors that get the time to shine here. Like I cannot remember the name of the agent but he's an actor that i've seen pop up in a couple things he is very good at being like charismatic and egotistical yet trying to be like the everyman and relatable like his character was very good one of the random italian henchmen is a uh, kevin kevin corrigan kevin god i cannot remember his name he pops up in everything like He's been in like super bad. Uh, he was on the show Grounded for Life. I can't remember. Kevin Corrigan, I want to say, is his name. Mm -hmm. And he's just like this person blink if you miss him. If you don't know him, he just blends right in. The skinny guy with the weird hair, that guy on the Italian side. Oh, but yeah, yeah there, there's so many different people in this movie that I love seeing them pop in. And I like seeing a lot of them kind of interact in that last Mexican standoff they have mm -hmm. in that hotel room. That That always just escalates so so nicely i think the crescendo is a little much like just like the splashing of tea in the face and that's what causes everybody to start shooting that kind of didn't really hit for me but everything else is great i don't know it's so quentin tarantino to me where it just goes just outrageous at that hyper violence just all over the place mm -hmm. oh gosh yeah Totally a Quentin Tarantino script right there. But I love I love every scene of this movie. And it's so bizarre because you're like, how is this movie going to work? We have so many different actors in here. We have so many different types of scenes. Uh, the music. The music is great, too. We didn't even talk about talking. the music yet. I I made by Tom Zimmer. Oh, so good. Right. Uh, I don't, it's like a whimsical kind of score in there. Like, I don't know how to even describe it. It's just like a cute little, like, couple beats in there. It's like kind of uplifting and almost popish in a way. But you have all this different kind of music in there, these different scenes. It's like you could lose track of this movie, you would think, but they just have an overarching story with all these characters, which keeps you focused on the movie. And I love the runtime of the movie. I love the pacing of the movie. That's why I like Tony Scott directing this because yeah. he kept the pace on flow where with Quentin Tarantino, sometimes he, with the pace, it gets a little off for me and the movies get too long. That's why I think the combo of Tony Scott directing, keeping the pace going, having that ending, but still the really strong script with Quentin Tarantino. I'm like, 
that's a perfect marriage right there. That is so good. I agree. I think this is between this and natural born killers. I would wholeheartedly go true romance. I think Tarantino and, um, Oh geez, Oliver Stone. I think those two are kind of oil and water a little bit like Oliver Stone already goes on side tangents. So throw Tarantino side tangents in there as well. It's kind of just non, it's non formatted, but I feel like in a bad way, this it kind of jumps from like scene to scene to scene, but they all string along together. And I think it plays so well. Yeah. Tony Scott was able to put some like, you know, standard plot points in this movie, I feel like, and make it make a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. Natural Born Killers. I watched that for the first time this year. I'm like, I'm getting so lost right now. What is happening? The scenes are so bizarre, that one. Eventually, by the end, it came together for me. But yeah, True Romance. Oh, True Romance, I, I can just go back to. It's such an easy watch. Right. The, the last time I, I, I'm a big letterbox guy. The last time I watched this, it was a four and a half. I want to say now, I, I haven't written my review yet because I wanted to wait till we did the podcast. I, I want, I think I'm at a five out of five on this sucker. Oh, like I, I don't, I don't throw that rating around all the time, but there's not a lot of things that I would change in here. Like maybe some of the language has not aged the best, but other than that, I can't think of any single thing that I would change too much. Yeah, it's tough. You try to think of what's the flaw with this movie. And I don't think there is one. Like every scene I'm enjoying for a different reason. Yeah, I don't think there's really an issue with this one. It's, it's just, it's pitch perfect. It's just so good. Yeah, this movie's great. And I think it, my score has gone up too. Like I never give fives. Like to get a five from me, correct? you would have to make like my top 100 movies of all time, which I, I wouldn't put, I don't know. This one is getting close to that, but not yet, not yet. And but I, I think I, when I, oh yeah. No, I, I always try to fight not giving a five. Yeah. Out of five. I'm just going over my stats now. I've seen 1,787 movies on my Letterbox account. I've given 41 a five out of five. Like oh, I yeah. never, ever do it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm going to do it again this time just because there, there's not a flaw. Every time I watch this movie, it gets better and better. And I yeah. think that's going to continue to happen. I don't see a reason why it would. Like, right, I always have the movie on while I'm doing the podcast. And right now, it's Gandolfini's scene where he's talking to Brad Pitt. Like, two characters that would never meet up in real life ever. <laughs> Gandolfini is being, like, arrogant yet intimidating. And Brad Pitt is just like, whatever, man. Yeah, they're here. I'll tell you whatever you want. Just <laughs> those, those, every... It doesn't matter what character interacts with another character. It's always entertaining in this movie even when it really shouldn't be. Oh, yeah. Man, you're making my score go up on this one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to. I no, just No, I like yeah. it because when I first saw this, you know, complete blind buy, I'm like, okay, this is good. I'll probably give it a three. That's like my standard this is good score, just a solid mm -hmm. three. But after watching it, I think a third time, or actually probably fourth time now with the commentaries in there, I would probably go four, at least a four, but... You make me want to even push it up more. I'm like, ooh, maybe after five more times, I might be like, oh, because it is so good. It's just, right. And it gets better. And I love that about those movies that are my favorite movies. That's how I decide what a favorite movie is of mine. Do I want to watch it again? How many times as I rewatch? Does it get better and better? And if this keeps going the way it is, it's going to be at that level right there. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm right there with you. It keeps on going up and up. I think one last thing we should talk about before we kind of end this thing. When when I, I I like watching the movie, but when I'm done watching the movie, I always go and dig into the special features just yeah. to kind of get some more information on the movie. The, the alternate ending on here is great. I always love it when a movie can go and throw that in here. I like seeing featurettes, like uh, especially when they're going behind the scenes, the making of, like as they're making the movie, because they don't know how it's going to be uh, portrayed when it gets released in theaters. It's always just so raw, and you get their true emotions in this. Um, I never listen to the commentaries. I'm not a big commentary guy, and you've said a couple times on the podcast that you have watched the commentaries. How were they on this release? Oh, they're brilliant. So I went through the Tony Scott one. And I learned so much in this movie. And like some stuff, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should have learned that about Tony Scott. That's, uh, I don't know if that keeps up to today because mm -hmm. it was like, oh, okay, you know, those scenes where 
uh, Alabama like starts crying and just bawling. You're like, man, she's giving such a good performance here. How like how can she do that? And then you find on the commentary, Tony Scott was known as the persuader when uh, Patricia Arquette would ask, like, hey, I'm not getting there. Can you bring the persuader in to get me there? Tony Scott's, yeah, would go in just psh, hard slap mm-hmm. in. That would get her into that. I'm like, mm-hmm. that doesn't really keep up. Uh, that's a little, you know, harsh to find out. But then you watch the other commentary with uh, Patricia Arquette and Christian Slater. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah, I would ask him to do that. And then it's like, okay, that's, you know, an interesting fact that we learned right. watching this. But just to see the perspectives that they give as they go through the movie because nobody sees the same movie the same way. So just to hear about their perspective watching it and them working on the movie, mm-hmm. it just kind of opens up. And it, you catch things in there you wouldn't normally catch. So that's what I love about it. And so I'm usually not a commentary person either, but I really liked it with the ones I chose for this movie. So I'm like, maybe in the future on some of my favorite movies, I might try out a commentary or two. Sure. And I... I don't watch commentaries when I'm watching the movie because I don't have a lot of time to watch movies as it is right now. So I just watch the movie for the movie there. I can't remember what podcast it is, but they, their main podcast feed is just putting up audio commentaries for movies that have been released. And I've listened to those because I have a very long drive to work back and forth. So then that's how I kind of get those nuggets, but I'm never able to actually like watch the movie while I'm listening to the commentary. So, uh, it's something I want to do more. I just wish I had more time to do, you know? Oh, yeah. It's it's rare when we have... I mean, we have so many movies we need to watch anyway. It's like, right, yeah, right. you want to watch the movie first. So, yeah, if this was, you know, my first or second time watching the movie, yeah, definitely I want to start it with the commentary. But like, oh, you know, in preparation, let, let's dive into this. Let's see what it's all about. I'm like, you know what? This is kind of fascinating because Tony Scott, you know, talks about picking the different ending and all that and how he edited scenes together and the music and... I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, this is pretty cool. I'm learning some facts in this movie. Yeah, and I bring, I, I watched as many special features as I could before we recorded this, but there's more that I will dig into after I'm done because there's some talking about like, because they have some interviews of the time period, like I said, but Aero Video also came out and put out new ones from oh, 2021. Yeah. No, nobody that starred in the movie, but people behind the scenes, like people who helped edit the movie, Oh, uh, we had a costume designer, people who helped Hans Zimmer with the score. That's the next one that I want to listen to. I, I, I love, I, I wish there was a documentary on here. There's no documentary. Like that, that's usually the first thing I go to on special feature wise, but there's enough interviews in here to where you can still kind of get that fix. Oh yeah. The new interviews are great and they worked with what they could. Of mm-hmm. course, I would love to go back in time and have a Tony Scott, like, you know, but obviously you can't do that, you know? Uh, but the music one, I can't wait till you watch the music one because I thought that one was fascinating. He's like, yeah, me and Hans Zimmer, we really worked on this together, but you could only give credit as a composer to one person. So, you know, you give it to Hans Zimmer. It's, right. And then I thought that was interesting. I'm like, oh, you can't like give two composer credits here. Like they can't class. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's a cool fact. Mm hmm. That's kind of a crappy fact, but yeah. I know. It's like you you apparently you can't list two people as a composer. Like you gotta have them under some other sound thing or something if you want to list them. I'm like, okay, that's didn't know that. <laughs> that yeah, that's very bizarre. Well, I, I think that's a good spot to end the podcast on there. I think we've got like everything we need to say. Do you have any closing bits on true romance you wanna give? Oh, uh, it's a must see. It's a must see. I, I agree it, too. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I I don't want you to listen to this podcast if you haven't seen it and it's too late now because we spoiled everything. But even with everything that we talked about, you're still going to enjoy what you watch in this movie just because it's, I think you have to see some of this stuff to kind of understand it. And once you do that, come back, listen to this again. And it's, I don't know. I I could talk about this movie for so, so long, but I feel like I would just be repeating myself. So I will, I will stop. Yeah, I mean, watching it will be a whole different experience because visually, this yeah. movie is stunning. There's just with the lighting, the camera work, it's just, it's a filmmaker's type of movie. It's really gorgeous to look at. And the, the transfer on this sucker, it's not super slick. It, it still seems like a 90s movie, yeah. like an early 90s movie. You still see some grain in there, but it looks great. It looks like how the movie was intended to look. Oh, yeah. It looks so good. But you can see so much details, too. Like, yeah. you look at the, the outfits and the hair, like, you still see all the details there. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yes, very good. Big, big recommends from both me 
and Mike. So yeah, if you haven't seen it, please go see it. Um, at the end of every podcast, I like to tease what I'm going to do the next podcast on. And this next episode is a movie that I haven't seen yet, but it's one that I've always wanted to, and I've heard that's a fun, it's a fun horror movie. I'm going to talk Idle Hands with uh, Parker, a.k.a. Blu-ray Daddy. Have you seen this movie before, Mike? I have not. I've always been curious because the cover looks so iconic with the yeah. hands that haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's got Devin Sawa and Seth Green and Jessica Alba, like I and the what the big kid from Mighty Ducks too. It's just uh, there's so many actors in this movie that I like that I'm finally glad. This is the, one of the main reasons why I started this podcast is so people could pick movies on my shelf that I need to watch <laughs> finally. And yeah, Idle Hands is the next one I'll do next week. Oh yeah, man, I'm excited for that because that's a movie I've been like it's been on my watch list for the longest time. Why haven't I picked this one up yet? So do you, I gotta do you, get to it. Do you keep track of your movies on any apps or anything just so you don't double dip? You don't. Okay. No, but it's all up here. I never double dip. I'm not a double dipper. Like I won't, you know, get a slip cover and a still book together. If I have it on a still book, it's not getting the slip cover. I'm very mm -hmm. just saying I do not double dip no matter what. See, now I'll upgrade the format once in a while. Sure. Like if yeah, I'm going right now, 4K mm -hmm. or DVD to whatever. I'll yeah, do that, yeah. but I won't. If I already have it on 4K, I'm not getting it on 4K in any other way. Unless it's like, okay, a franchise box that came out and I already had the first one. Okay, I'll get the franchise one. But yeah. that's about it. See, my brain is not a steel trap like yours, Mike. I, I have to have it on my person when I'm buying stuff. Otherwise, I will double dip and I won't mean to. But on the app that I use, my movies, it I can categorize it as to like what movies I've seen in my collection as opposed to movies I haven't seen. And right now it's at like a 65-35 split. 35% of the movies that are in this collection I have not seen. See, so that again, would drive me wild, man. Because I try to see everything. Like when I get yeah. it and I'm ready, like I will watch it. I won't put it on the shelf until I've watched it. So that helps me out a lot. I've probably at least seen 90% of the stuff in my collection. Maybe even 95% of the stuff. So mm -hmm. I try to keep up with it. as I get it in. I'm like, I need to watch it. I have to watch it before it goes on the shelf. But I mean, just in this podcast, like I watched 12 Angry Men for the first time. I watched Witness for the first time. Oh, I love oh, getting sure. movies to where I think I'll like them. I've heard good things about them. I'll watch them sometime. And now I'm finally watching them and getting to talk with them for the first time. I'm hoping Idle Hands is the same way. We shall see next week. But this has been very fun, Mike. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Is there anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Oh, man. I could talk about my channel forever. But let me actually turn it back to you, Jake, and say, because you got an amazing audience out there, why do you think they should go by my channel, subscribe, and what content do you think they should be checking out on my channel? Oh, geez. Um, I, uh, like I said in the intro, the the – Stuff that I look forward to watching the most on your channel is the breakdown analysis of the numbers that sell, like the DVD, 4K, Blu-ray. I love seeing that pie chart. Um, it's just, yeah, it, it it's very soothing to me and informative as well, just to kind of see how sales are going and why DVDs are still like the majority of physical media sales. That drives me nuts to this day. Oh, yeah. Mega movie numbers every week, audience. That's what Jake's talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. have that every week. Uh, also cover Amazon deal videos every Monday. So you want to save yourself some money while you're collecting this stuff. You want to check out that, of course. Uh, physical media news topic videos, ranking videos, recommendation videos, hauls, hunts. I mean, you name it. I have like over a thousand videos on my channel. So I do live streams at least every other week. Uh, next live stream I have on my channel will be a split the room game. Uh, and Jake, I don't think I've had you on a split the room yet. We got to no, get you on one of those eventually. Oh, it's so fun. Oh, my God. Uh, the topic for the next one, and I think it's in a couple Fridays, is is this movie rotten or not? Okay. And you're trying to convince half the people that it is and half the people that it isn't. If you get a split, you get the most points. So people vote and you try to get points, and it's a whole game. It's really, really fun. So that's going to be a good live stream. We just did a, a, a comedy prop movie stream. We did a Ghostbuster stream, so this month has been packed with tons of fun live streams, so definitely check that out. Um, we're making the push to 2,000 subs. I'm about it's 20 really close. away, yeah. about 20 mm -hmm. away, so I know, hey, the audience out there, you can make that happen. So, right. Yeah, I can't, can't wait for you guys to check it out and have a good time. 
we're live streaming now on YouTube, but I always I also put this on the podcast providers of Spotify's Apple Podcast. His link to his YouTube is in this description. Let's get him to 2K. I like this guy's content quite a bit. We can make that push. Let's go. Man, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, thank you, Mike, for coming on the podcast. It, it's been a blast talking true romance. Thank you for making me talk about this movie again. Anytime I can, I will definitely talk true romance. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I, we love this movie, so it was great. Absolutely, yes. Well, this has been episode number 26 of Boutique Talk. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. And until next time, I'll see you. Have a good one.